Welcome back to part two of the top signs of cancer in your pet. If you are just joining, don't forget to go back and watch part one because we went through some really important things to help you find cancer earlier in your pet. But let's dive in and let's finish up with the rest of the top signs of cancer in pets. All right. Sign number four is sores that don't heal. So what do I mean by that? Those are usually some of those lumps and bumps that we were just talking about. So these can be over the trunk of the body. Sometimes these will be digit masses. These can be along the mammary chain masses. Number five, our fifth sign of cancer is persistent lameness or stiffness. And so we're not talking about arthritis here, but what we're trying to think about is the most common bone cancer in dogs, which is osteosarcoma. And so I'm going to direct you to my osteosarcoma playlist uh, back on the YouTube channel. Uh, we have a whole playlist. I have three videos that are pretty recent about osteosarcoma, everything that you need to know. So we have one about amputation, which is vlog number 67. Everything that you need to know about bone cancer uh, is 71 and then everything about treatment is 72. So that is gonna be a good overview, but what we're talking about here for about top signs is that persistent lameness. And what is really important is to know that high risk breeds uh, and dogs for osteosarcoma. So osteosarcoma or bone cancer is the most common bone cancer that we see in dogs. So 85% of bone cancer is osteosarcoma. So there are some other less common bone cancers that we see. Uh, it is a cancer that is locally aggressive, so it's very destructive in the bone and also has a high spread rate. So it's really important that we catch it early. It's estimated to be about 5% of all cancers overall and greater than 10,000 dogs per year will be diagnosed with osteosarcoma. It is a cancer most classically of large and giant breed dogs. High risk locations are towards the knee and away from the elbow. And we're gonna put up a graphic that shows that. So away from the elbow is gonna be by the wrist, the distal radius, by the shoulder, proximal humerus, and then the end of the femur bone and the top of the tibia bone, and then also by the hock as well. A large and giant breed dog that is lame and swelling at one of these high risk locations, you need to do x-rays promptly, like now. Don't wait a month. If you go home on pain meds to see if they get better on pain meds because you think maybe it's just a soft tissue injury, that's possible but you should go back in a couple of weeks and get x-rays because you know what's gonna happen is the pain meds usually make them feel a little bit better and the swelling goes down because it's an anti-inflammatory. So I really think we need to be doing x-rays much more promptly. And remember, small dogs can get bone cancer and we can see bone cancer in other besides the lung bones as well. So any bone of the body is at risk as well. But again, I'm just more proactive in the high risk breeds and the high risk locations. And please check out the osteosarcoma playlist for more information about bone cancer. Oral cancer, cancer of the mouth, is the fourth most common cancer in dogs. A foul smell can be a sign of oral cancer. It can also be a sign of dental disease and that they need their teeth cleaned. So it's important that we follow up on that foul smell. Uh, not all pets that have oral cancer will exhibit pain with eating um, and have trouble eating. So it's a good idea to consult your veterinarian if you have that foul smell. A lot of the times they do need sedation for a really good oral exam for the reasons that I explained. They're not going to hold their mouth open and even if they do, it's very hard to do a complete oral exam in a dog and cat. So uh, we do see a couple of different cancers in dogs versus cats. The next sign that is connected with that. So difficulty swallowing and difficulty eating. Sometimes owners will notice blood in the food bowl or in the water bowl as well. So those are the things that we want to be thinking about. And then some of the tumors in the head and neck area, also in the nasal area, can cause difficulty breathing as well. So they can put pressure on the different structures, whether it's respiratory or you know associated with eating and can make it difficult for your pet to eat, drink, and sometimes breathe as well. Uh, sometimes it's putting pressure near the esophagus, the nose, any of those symptoms. 
Number eight, difficulty urinating or difficulty defecating. And you know, if your dog goes in the yard, it's going to be a hard one to notice. So I found I did my internship and my residency at the Animal Medical Center in New York City. And I have to be honest, guys, if you because I walked my dog in New York City, rain, sleet or snow, us pet owners in New York City or in any big city, you tend to know more about your dog's pee or poop than, you know, now I live in the suburbs and I can let my dogs out. And so you may not see everything that goes on, especially if you have a big yard with lots of woods, which we don't. And for the record, my dogs eat each other poop, which is disgusting. So they get, they get supervised in the backyard. So the good news for us is that we are seeing if they have difficulty urinating or defecating because that is one of the signs of cancer. Was that TMI? Sorry, it's really gross. I don't know why they do it. If only, if only I knew a good veterinarian. Anyway, so um, when we're thinking about difficulty urinating, we're thinking about uh, urinary tract tumors. So bladder tumors are gonna be the most common urinary tract tumor. Uh, it's more common in dogs than cats and they can have difficulty urinating. Sometimes they'll have symptoms that are similar to a urinary tract infection. So they will be urinating more frequently. Sometimes they'll have blood in the urine and they'll be straining just lots of frequent small amounts. Uh, with difficulty defecating, Sometimes you'll notice that they'll have difficulty pooping. Sometimes their poop will just, they'll be straining to get it out. Sometimes the poop is flatter, abnormal color. Um, sometimes they could have a mass near the butt or the anus. Uh, actually, just today, I met a new patient that was diagnosed with an anal sac tumor. So that's another thing. So it'd be great if you could keep an eye on your pet's ability to urinate and defecate and note any abnormalities and anything abnormal. You know what you should do bring them to your veterinarian or give us a call. I do wanna talk real briefly about bladder tumors. I haven't done another video about it and they are one of the cancers that are often found late and they are one that are often treated with antibiotics before because a lot of the times what's confusing is these dogs do have urinary tract infections and they get better on antibiotics. So if you have a middle-aged and older dog with recurrent urinary tract infections, we, I do often suspect um, bladder cancer. Sometimes there are some new additional tests that we can do. There's something called a BRAF mutation test. I just recently wrote an article about that that will be coming out and I do have a post about that um, on Instagram. So, but again, we'll, to keep a lookout for that. So that is a new urine test that can help uh, diagnose bladder cancer in dogs. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, and then also ultrasounds, another test that we'll often use. So again, bladder cancer tends to be middle-aged and older dogs, very similar symptoms to urinary tract infections. And again, one of those frustrating ones that often is found late in the course of disease. So if you have an 11 year old dog, you know, I'm gonna think about that differently than if I have a one or two year old dog. Uh, there are also certain breeds that account for about one third of the dogs that get bladder cancer. So common ones that I think about are like Westies and Border Collies and Scottish Terriers as well. So, and there are some things that interestingly that you can do with bladder cancer to prevent cancer. That's really cool. So uh, things like limit exposure to lawn chemicals, increase the amount of vegetables vegetables that your dogs are eating, especially for high risk breeds. And then for me, for those high risk breeds, I like to screen more often uh, and with this cadet graph mutation test and ultrasound as well. So again, find out if your dog is a high risk breed and then talk to your veterinarian about screening and be on the lookout for my new article. And once it is in there, I'll put a link uh, below. So if it's not there yet, uh, it takes a little bit to get through the editing process, but keep a link out, for, keep a link out, keep a lookout for the link below about my new article about uh, this mutation test. Number nine, bleeding or discharge from any opening. I know, some of this stuff's really gross. Sorry, what can I do? I'm, don't kill the messenger. Okay, so bleeding can be a sign of cancer and other illness as well. So any opening, nose, mouth, 
but those are usually the ones that we're thinking about. So oral cancer can cause the gums to bleed, nose cancer can cause nasal bleeding, uh, we could have blood in the urine and blood in the feces. So those are the things that is really important that we're keeping an eye out for um, when our pets are doing their business. Um, again, other things can cause that as well. So nosebleeds don't only mean nose cancer or fungus, uh, fungal diseases of the nasal cavity can cause it and sometimes rhinitis, high blood pressure, other things as well. But you know what? If you see that, what are you gonna do? Go see your veterinarian. Last but not least, sign number 10 is a persistent cough. Does cough mean your pet has cancer? No, there are other things that can cause it. Heart disease, pneumonia, and things like that. So for younger dogs, I might be thinking kennel cough, but for older dogs, so middle-aged and older dogs that dry persistent cough could indicate a tumor near the heart or um, lung cancer as well. So primary lung cancer in dogs is quite uncommon, for very different than people where primary lung cancer is one of the top five cancers. In dogs, when we typically think of lung cancer, it's sadly usually a primary cancer elsewhere that has metastasized or spread to the lungs Sometimes it could be lung cancer that spread to the other part of the lungs, but usually it's cancer somewhere else in the body, maybe bone cancer or something like that, that has metastasized or spread to the lungs. So what you're gonna do with your vet um, is to get start with some chest x-rays to see what's going on. And usually x-rays are gonna be a great way for us to help figure out what is the underlying cause of the cough. Cats personally tend to see less metastatic cancer to the lungs than we do in dogs. The right test to start for, in my opinion, usually with blood work and a good exam as well. If we find that the cancer is metastasized, uh, if we see lots of metastasis, we'll often try to find the primary cancer first uh, with some other imaging, so CT scans or ultrasound or other things like that. So you can talk to a specialist or your veterinarian about that. So how often should you go to your vet? And that is a great question. And for me, my recommendation is, especially middle-aged and older pets, you should be going twice a year, every six months. What? Yes, every six months. Think about how our pets age. So, you know, they say for a dog, you know, every year is like five to seven years. So going to your doctor every couple of years, especially as we get to middle aged and older, is really not unreasonable. Same thing for cats. So when is middle age? So that's gonna depend, especially for dogs, there's more vari you know, variability with that. So large and giant breed dogs, if you have a Great Dane or a cane, cane corso I just saw the other day. Those dogs, middle age, it's gonna start earlier. So three, four is probably when you're gonna wanna start to do those biannual exams. If you have a little chihuahua, you know, that's gonna be later. For cats, middle age, I'd say around maybe seven. So that's it. Those are 10 signs of cancer in dogs and cats. And what I really want you to think about is being proactive with your pet's health. I want you to think about these warning signs and look for them regularly in your pet. And remember that these warning signs don't mean cancer, but they're great reasons to call your vet, bring your pet in for an exam, uh, maybe you know blood work, different diagnostics, but it's really important that we look for these signs rarely and that you are your pet's advocate. If you sense something is wrong, bring your pet in for an exam and talk to your veterinarian. Regular wellness exams with your veterinarian, provide your veterinarian an opportunity to check not only for signs of cancer, do that physical exam, monitor body weight. I hope you found this helpful. I hope you found this useful. Please don't forget to subscribe, comment. I'm really here to help you. I hope this was good information for you. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to empower you and educate you. And I'll see you at the next video.